Welcome to episode 25 of the Self Care 101 podcast with your host, Pooja K. McClymon, helping people achieve their full potential with effective self care through wellbeing coaching. Thank you so much for listening today. On this episode, I interview a lady that I am very humbled to also have the privilege of working with. Dr. Deepa Apte is a renowned Ayurvedic practitioner and MD. Her spa, Ayurveda Pura, is where she treats clients with traditional healing practices and hosts a number of Ayurvedic courses for therapists and practitioners. Ayurveda is the ancient Indian holistic medical system. It's based on achieving physical and mental harmony with nature, which has been practiced for more than 5,000 years. Ayurveda means science of life. Ayu meaning life and Veda meaning science and was first recorded in the Vedas, the world's oldest surviving literature. Now as an Indian, I grew up with Ayurvedic principles just being a way of life. No one ever announced that anything we were doing was Ayurvedic, but I remember seeing my dad practice yoga Just by doing stretches, I thought nothing of it, but it was yoga. I remember my mum saying never to eat fish with dairy and how certain dishes like sal can only be made during the season that it grows. Plus, I can't tell you the number of turmeric milks that I had to drink when I was sick. Believe me, I've said it before in another podcast. Turmeric latte, turmeric milk, it's like benelin (laughs) for us. Now, as my practice has grown and developed, I've realized that without even knowing it, I have been incorporating Ayurvedic principles of balance and holistic views to my techniques, always looking to work on a client's goals by reviewing their whole life. So when I met Deepa, we chatted for hours and she endorsed to me herself that so much of what I was saying about my coaching practice was Ayurvedic. I hope this podcast enlightens you on Ayurveda, the truth about yoga, and how you can bring some of these principles into your own life. So let's get to it. I am so excited to be doing this interview finally with Dr. Deepa Apte. We met last year, right, in the, around the summertime, sort of into autumn, and it was such an honour to meet her, and we spent a good hour, didn't we, on our first meeting, just talking about everything Ayurvedic and coaching, and it was a real moment for me when you said that, my God, so much of what you're saying is so Ayurvedic, and we were sort of laughing about it. It was wonderful, and I think a lot of our thought processes are quite similar in terms of well-being and and how people can you know live their lives better and through balance and all those wonderful things which you're going to talk about and I wanted I talk about Ayurveda in some of my podcasts and in some of the work that I do with clients but I feel that it's a lot better because I'm not a practitioner that you know somebody like yourself who does this day in day out and has been doing it for so long can share with the listeners exactly what Ayurveda is and how most importantly you can incorporate it into modern living because I think there's a lot of misconception with Ayurveda that you have to have all these herbs and you have to be vegetarian and you have to do this and you have to do that when actually in reality there are adjustments as part of the philosophy that you can make so enough of me. (laughs) Dr. Deepa, if you'd like to introduce yourself and then tell the listeners what Ayurveda really is. Thanks a lot, first of all, for having me here on this podcast. Uh, As Pooja was just saying, yes, um, I am an Ayurvedic practitioner. My background is actually in medicine. So I first qualified as a medical doctor, then I studied Ayurveda and then I studied yoga. So there used to be a time when I used to uh, combine all the three systems in my practice. Mm -hmm. But then ever since I moved to London, I started my own work. I have been focusing on Ayurveda and yoga. And as you rightly said, the last time that we met, and time does fly, (laughs) uh, quite a few months ago, uh, when we first met and we started chatting about the kind of work that you do and what I do, it was so nice to see that a lot of things that we do are so similar Mm. and that is how you know that that whole if you want to call it the partnership started between you and me saying okay let's do things together yeah and that is how now here we are recording our first podcast together and today it's more about ayurveda and probably a little bit about yoga too yes but focusing more on ayurveda yeah and of course um every time i go out there meet new people or talk about ayurveda to people Many of them, I would say probably 95% of the people do say, oh yes, I have heard of Ayurveda, Mm -hmm. but I don't really know what it is. 
So in today's podcast, I'm hoping that, you know, I'm able to give that information across to be able to make Ayurveda a bit more simple, but more importantly, practical. Mm-hmm. As, of course, you know, Pooja, as you already know, because you come from that background, but for this, this is for the listeners. Many of you may have heard that whenever we talk about Ayurveda, we always say Ayurveda is the ancient holistic system from India, which is approximately three or four thousand years old. But then whenever I talk about it to people, I always say that just because we say 3,000 years old, it does not mean that 3,000 years ago, one morning, one human being woke up saying, let me create Ayurveda. Right. That is not what Ayurveda is. As the word itself goes, the first part of the word Ayu, meaning uh, life, and Veda, meaning science. And hence, when put together, it's science of life or knowledge of life, wisdom of life. Mm-hmm. And hence, from that point of view, one way of looking to Ayurveda is that as long as life has been around, this particular science or system has been around. So it's not just 3,000 years old. It is much, much older than that. Mm-hmm. Because once again, what we have to remember is now when I say life, even for me to live, I need, you know, these so-called non-living elements, but essential elements like space or fire, water, and without these, I can't live. That means these elements become a part of my life. Mm. And hence, we believe that, you know, elements like space, air, they have been there for a very, very long time. So from that point of view, we believe that Ayurveda does not have an age, or, you know, we can't put a time limit to it. Mm -hmm. And same thing, on the other hand, when we say that it is the ancient holistic system from India, Of course, it is an Indian system of medicine, but it doesn't mean that it is only Indians who can practice it. Mm -hmm. As the word goes, you know, science of life, that means wherever there is life, this particular science or system exists, Mm -hmm. meaning out there in India, out here in UK. Because the way Ayurveda is, science of life, and life is around us. That means it is that nature around us. And what Ayurveda says is that whatever we are, we are nothing but a reflection or result of that environment around us. So we're always looking into the environment on the outside and then assessing, you know, how that may be affecting us on the inside. That's interesting because when you talk about environment, I use a tool in my coaching practice Mm -hmm. called the Wellbeing Wheel. And there are 12 basically areas of your life within that. So detoxing, physical, Mm -hmm. food, uh, emotions, integrity, spirituality, and environment is one of those. And it's one of those that when I'm talking to clients, it's like, you know, you have your own space and you've got your workplace, but... If you need more, you know, uh, daylights, you know, that that's what sort of invigorates you than working in a corporate office block with concrete all around you. And you're literally back on back to back of buildings to say somewhere like Canary Wharf. You're not stimulating your environment to suit you and your needs. And so when you're looking for a job, for instance, when I'm talking to clients, you've got to look at where that office space is and all those things. I just thought, sorry, yeah, <laughs> it was just something no, that I, just sparked me when you said absolutely it. Absolutely correct. Because, mm. you know, whenever, whenever I'm teaching, I'm always telling people that, you know, whenever it's cold out there, mm. we feel cold. Yes. Whenever it's hot out there, we feel hot. It's just not a natural environment, but our own, if you want to call it, you know, like developed environment. Mm-hmm. And the best example I can give is, let's say if you have got a group of teenagers playing out there, but, you know, they're laughing, they're having fun. You look at them, you laugh, but you feel safe. You think, yes. oh, you know, they are there. But the same group of teenagers, if they start yelling, shouting, you know, kicking each other or anything like that, likewise, we feel a bit restless and a bit unsafe. Right. So right. that is how that environment always affects us. Mm. So like when people are sort of, if they come into work and they're quite stressy or, or frantic and you're not, but then all of a sudden, because their energy has filled the room, I did a podcast a couple of weeks ago about energy exchange, they come in and then you absorb almost mm. their their franticness, don't you, when you're actually fine to begin with, but we do, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So that is, and having said that, you know, that is one thing that Ayurveda really stresses on mm-hmm. is the environment wow. you know environment at home environment at the office or even when you're going out meeting friends all of that affects us so one of the main principles in terms of you know therapy or practice in ayurveda is just not about looking into the individual for who they are but also assessing what the environment around them is wow. so based on that then we're looking into you know what illnesses conditions or how we can correct them mm-hmm. so yeah so I'm sure you could talk about environment. Oh, we so good. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so that is one of the important things in Ayurveda. Mm-hmm. But then, of course, you know, as many people may have heard in Ayurveda, we do talk about body types mm-hmm. or constitutions. Mm-hmm. But again, when we talk about body types, I'm sure people may have heard there are three main body types. The first one is called Vata. 
So when we say vata, it literally means air. And hence such people, just the way air moves, such people also, they're very restless, they're active, they think a lot, like was a very creative. But then also to remember that, you know, when that air becomes a bit more uh, kind of, you know, strong or moves a lot, that means it becomes a bit chaotic or irregular. Mm-hmm. Likewise, that means such people may also have that attitude towards, you know, like irregular lifestyle or their food habits or everyday routine may be a bit irregular. So that is what, you know, a vata body type is. The second one we say pitta. So the moment we use the term pitta, it means heat or fire. And just the way fire has got the quality of being more penetrating, more sharp. Likewise, such people also, they're very kind of, you know, they're focused, they're determined, they know exactly what they want in life. Mm-hmm. But then on the other hand, of course, you know, fire is hot. That means such people may also then have tendencies towards feeling hot or sweating or tendency towards becoming a bit more irritable, angry. So that is, you know, some example about pitta related body type. Mm-hmm. And the third one that is called kapha. And kapha actually is a combination of water and earth. Now, when we say water, you will see that water has got the quality of being soft, gentle and flowing. Like where such people also, they are more adapting, they just go with the flow. But kapha also has earth and earth is heavy. So that also then gives them the quality of being more patient and stable. You know, so we are looking to such qualities. But what Ayurveda says is that you're not just one body type or Mm -hmm. one energy. You can be a combination of one, two or all three put together. I was going to ask you about that because... In sort of modern times where people are taking on Ayurvedic practices and, you know, you can see Ayurvedic practitioners around quite a bit now online, they, they always tend to do the dosha test and, you know, def- what, what is it? Yeah, sort of, yeah, 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 define your dosha. Yeah, they say discover your dosha. Yeah, exactly, yeah. within 30 seconds. And obviously you and I know there is so much more to defining that and it's not absolute yeah. and it's dynamic and it depends on what's happening with that person at the, at the time okay. and yeah. it could change and th- there's just so much involved isn't it so how do you so when a client comes to you for instance is it the dosha that you look at first what, what are the first few steps um, see uh, when you're talking about dosha again to remember the term dosha in Ayurveda literally means a fault or a mistake mm-hmm. so there is a big difference between a body type and dosha oh. so you know when you're saying you know they do all these questions when they're saying discover your dosha that yeah. is actually wrong because you can't discover a person's fault, you know, each individual is unique. Oh, wow, okay. So you're looking into that person's qualities, you know, like, uh-huh. okay, fine, you know, what are their hobbies, what their, their likes, dislikes. I'm not necessarily looking for their negative qualities mm-hmm. or faults. Mm-hmm. So that is one thing, as you said, you know, you find all these dosha questionnaires online. Yeah. But then again, now when we use the term dosha through that, it may also mean whatever illness or imbalance that they may have nowadays. Mm-hmm. So yes, you know, that is what you're looking to assess what that might be. But of course, you know, if when someone comes for a consultation, um, people come for many different reasons. It might just be to help, you know, maintain health, Mm -hmm. or they might have some illness, disease, or let's say natural phases of life, you know, so someone is looking to get pregnant, or during pregnancy or postnatal phase, you know, so there's some healthy kind of happy times also when people come. Mm -hmm. But then throughout, one of the main things that we are always looking to do is find out a person's body type or constitution. Now, when we say body type or constitution, again, one thing that everyone should remember is that each person just doesn't have one body type. They have two different body constitutions, meaning the first one is the one that they are born with. So mm-hmm. they we call it the basic body type. And the best way of looking into it is like it's like your DNA imprint. It's your identity, meaning you know, it will always be with you and it won't change. But the other body type of constitution is for what we are nowadays. We believe that whatever that we are nowadays is a result of all the influences around us. You know, it can be family, friends, work, travel, weather, you know, things that are happening. Mm -hmm. And the best way of comparing your basic body type and your today's constitution, your basic body type is like a solid hard surface. You know, it won't move. It won't change. Mm -hmm. It's there. Mm -hmm. It can be metal. It can be wooden. It can be steel. But your today's constitution is more like a layer of dust on the solid hard surface and the aim is to wipe away that layer of dust. So how do you define what the person's basic body type is? What do you do? Um, in simple words, we say that you know, things that people love to do okay. is a part of their basic body type. Mm-hmm. But then things that people end up doing or they have to do mm-hmm. is the imbalance. You know, that's, that's an yeah. easy way of putting it across. But when people come to me, then uh, the best way of finding out a person's basic body type is by checking their pulse. Because mm-hmm. we believe that 
whenever people are giving answers or talking about things, they're talking about it from the point of view that uh, what they think they are. Okay, so they're but, sort of in their mind as opposed yeah. to sort of yeah. talking from the heart. And I think this is something that we talk about as a culture about, you know, being in your head or yeah, your yeah, heart. Yeah. This is what leading from your heart really yeah. means, right? Yeah. And but yeah, but we say that you know once it is only when you check the pulse because the pulse does not fly. It's like you know if the blood pressure is high, it will be high. Even though I'm saying it's low, you know, mm-hmm. meaning it's a two different mm-hmm. two different ways of looking into it. So what I do is I ask them a lot of questions in the beginning, everything to do with their presenting symptoms, complaints. But then one thing that is different in Ayurveda compared to any other science is that in Ayurveda we also looking to discover their our actual self, their unique constitution. Oh, wow, okay. Any other signs, people always go saying, yes, I've got a lower back problem, I've got a headache, I've got insomnia. So all that they're looking to do is find out causes for that. But in Ayurveda, we're also asking questions like, okay, fine, so what are your hobbies? You know, what mm-hmm. kind of foods do you like to eat? So if you had some free times, what would you love to do? So we are assessing that person as a whole mm-hmm. rather than just illnesses or diseases. Mm. So, of course, you know, we do ask a lot of questions, but then classically we do like pulse diagnosis, tongue diagnosis. So based on all this information put together, we get to know what their basic body type is or what their today's constitution is. Or through in Ayurveda, through pulse, we also get to know about the different phases of life. You know, so a lot right. that we get to know. Okay. That's interesting that you were talking about the imbalances, learning about those and in, in when people do sort of go to the doctor or something and they talk about lower back pain, it tends to be that the symptoms are being covered up. So there might be a, a, a heat patch given or mm-hmm. uh, some tablets to alleviate pain, discomfort, etc. And something that of something that I use in my coaching practice when I'm speaking with a client is to get to the root of the problem. I'm not a counselor, so I don't dwell there. But if I can have the, if we can identify where the root of an issue is, so like self confidence issues, um, stress, you know, the uh, the overachieving that that people have in them, if we can find out where this all comes from, it's a lot easier then to have that as a reference point to move them forward. And this was sort of something that when we were talking, when we met, we were talking about and really connected because Ayurveda goes to, and obviously, you know, you, you, you explain it better than me, but it goes to the root, the source of the problem, the imbalance, if you like, and then looks to treat it that way. So it's not always obvious the treatment process that's going to occur, mm-hmm. but because you're look in Ayurveda, am I am I right? Yeah, that's yeah. correct. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you remember, you know, then when we first met, I also gave an example that let's say if someone came with a headache, mm-hmm. you know, just because they come with a headache, I'm not just going to say okay, fine. Even Ayurvedically saying, oh yeah, go ahead, have ginger lemon tea or eat khichdi or whatever. We are actually once again looking into the quality of the headache. You know how the headache is, mm-hmm. but again cause. Some people may say, oh, yes, I get a headache when it is too windy, dry, cold. But others say, oh, no, I get migraines when it's really hot and humid. Mm-hmm. But others say when it is raining, you know, wet and kind of damp, I get headaches. That means the cause is mm-hmm. different. So based on that, then even the plan or the approach changes. So it's just not about giving an aspirin or, you know, again, Ayurvedic is just not about saying ginger lemon tea to all the three. Right. Because if ginger is too heating, that means if someone with that, you know, uh, cause of being you know like hot and damp headaches Mm -hmm. it'll make it worse so you're always going back to the cause this is this is i mean this is more of like giving an example but um i've noticed that a lot of my clients when they get their time of the month Mm -hmm. they tend to a certain age group tends to get headaches that i don't get headaches yet but i've recently started having migraines and it's it tends to be during that time of the month now I, obviously, you're the expert, but I I would have thought it's because there's there's extra heat in the mm-hmm. body because of you yeah, know that's it. You see, when there is a cause, as I said earlier, you know when it is hot out there, yeah. you will feel hot on the right. inside. When it is cold out there, you will feel cold on the inside. Mm-hmm. So of course, you know the heat may be generated from inside too, mm-hmm. but ultimately we are looking on the outside. Okay. Because now when we're talking about uh, environment on the outside, just not natural environment, but it can be work, it can be stress, you know. It can be anything. It's even something I know it's going on at the moment everywhere where people are talking about the coronavirus and stuff yes. like that. You know, even though we are not affected here, but back of our mind, we're still stressed. Right. You know, it's like yeah. everyone is thinking, okay, fine, holidays are coming up. Do we travel? We don't travel. Mm. You know, so all of that True. leads to that cause from inside. And you start thinking about so many different things. The heat starts increasing. Right. So, so yeah, you know, that external cause will affect that internal cause uh-huh. and that internal cause will lead to that symptom or problem. Okay. So what do what do clients usually come to you for? 
Mm-hmm. Are they coming for specific reasons yeah. or general? Yeah. So uh, my kind of clientele, they're quite varied. Mm-hmm. I mean, like quite a lot, literally even f- uh, from the point of view of age, I get newborn babies as clients for, uh, until like, you know, clients who are like 80, 85, 90, you know, so there's mm-hmm. a big kind of, you know, age variation, but even in terms of presentation. So it might be f- any medical conditions, probably like, you know, eczema or diabetes or under or overactive thyroid or, you know, autoimmune conditions or, or as I said, you know, happy times. So someone's looking to get pregnant, so they want to do like a cleanse or detox, mm-hmm. and like preparing for the next phase or during pregnancy or postnatal phase. Or I get uh, postnatal phase uh, clientele, meaning, you know, mother and child, baby, where I'm showing the mother how to do an I- newborn I with a you know, hot oil baby massage. Mm-hmm. So the clientele is quite varied. Mm-hmm. But of course, uh, predominantly, I do get clients with more, you know, like medical conditions and illnesses. So have they already gone to their doctors and now they're seeking additional support or are they already supporters of Ayurveda and its principles? It's actually a mix of both. Okay. Because a lot of uh, people may have been to the doctors, they've tried everything and nothing has worked. Then they say, I've heard that Ayurveda works. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, uh, because I've done a consultation for this one client and it has really worked, so they might go and talk about it to someone else. So this other person may have observed, you know, let's say symptoms of IBS, so they may not go to the doctors first, mm-hmm. but they'll come here and say, but I've heard that Ayurveda really helps. So it's a big kind of, you know, it's a mix of everything. And one thing sometimes does also happen is that, you know, of course, the client will come in the beginning, they'll come for a few follow-ups, then they completely disappear. Right. For two years, three years, but then they come back again after two years because <laughs> something else has come up. So such times those clients usually say, no, I have not gone to the GP, but I've come to you because mm-hmm. last time things really helped. I'm hoping it'll help. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there's a big mix of, you know, like they might have either tried general, uh, like allopathy medication, nothing has worked, or the other way. Mm. But I mean, that's interesting that you say that they'll go away for a few years and then come back again, because that's sort of where this is where our link comes into play that we we were sort of looking at is that the coaching process prepares you for change because essentially when you're coming to an Ayurvedic doctor to talk about your ailments etc the plan the prescription if you like that's given to you is going to inflict upon lifestyle changes and some of those can be quite extreme if you're not used to you know like for us being vegetarian is very easy because we sort of grow up eating more vegetarian food than we do meat but somebody who's always eaten meat and say part of your prescription was adjustments in the diet it can be quite overwhelming and not and that then stresses them out so then that sort of perpetuates the problem as well right Uh, see one thing that we do say in Ayurveda that everything that you look out there is Ayurvedic Mm -hmm. so if someone has been used to eating meat all their life I would never even if needed I would never say you have to become vegetarian Mm -hmm. because in Ayurveda we believe that if the body is used to something if you suddenly stop it goes into that state of chaos you know it doesn't want to do this is interesting actually I think it's something like you know in your coaching I'm sure your thing is about you know gradual change yes you know, so this is what we again follow in Ayurveda. Yeah. So, but of course, you know, even when the gradual change needs to take place, it needs to be, how can I say, uh, well organized in a way. Mm. So it's not that, you know, if I see that yes, there's too much heat in the body and they shouldn't eat meat. So I'll start saying that, okay, fine, avoid red meat avoid certain heating foods and when they get used to that then I would say okay fine now you can start avoiding poultry and chicken when they get used to that then I might say okay fine now you can stop fish so it's that gradual change that they're looking into so again it's a different kind of coaching Mm -hmm. but from from a more Ayurvedic point of view where you know like you are looking into that individual specifically yeah Yeah. so that's actually quite a good segue into food because food plays a huge part in Ayurveda doesn't it Mm -hmm. And I know that I've seen some people that I follow and they've recently done like kitchery de- detoxes, you know, for like five days, seven days, that's all they're eating. Now, growing up on kitchery, kitchery is medicine food. It's when it's food, that, the way I know it is you're given kitchery when you're sick, when you're not feeling well, because it's comfortable for the stomach to process. So when I see people eating it day in, day out for a five day cleanse, I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> like you're going to get sick of it. So... There's two things here. One is 
what role does food play in Ayurveda? And then the second one, I think after you've explained the seriousness of the role that food plays, I think then we'll go into sort of talking about some of these misconceptions and because the misconceptions can actually end up harming you rather than doing the good that you think it's going to do. Um, yeah. In Ayurveda, we say that you are what you eat. Okay. Literally. Okay. And meaning, you know, the best way of explaining that is like, let's say if you've been eating a lot of spicy food over a few days, weeks, and you automatically feel a bit irritable, a bit impatient. If you eat a lot of uh, heavy, cold foods, again, you feel a bit heavy, a okay. bit slow, you know. So yeah. you will see that whatever that you eat, your responses are accordingly. So for us, of course, you know, we look into food not as food, but it is again more medicine. Okay. And having said that in Ayurveda, there is again another saying that Ayurveda begins from your kitchen. Okay. Meaning anything that you see in your kitchen cabinet, be it spices or foods, vegetables, fruits, mm -hmm. they all can be turned into medicine based on you know, how you're looking to use it. Okay. So for us, food plays a very important, big role. Because one thing, of course, you know, diverting a bit over here, you will see that nowadays... When we talk about fasting, mm. people are thinking about food fasting. That is what we always think. Okay, fine, I'm going to fast. Oh, so the conception is, oh, yeah, that means a person is going to be, eat, going to be eating for those two, three days. Mm -hmm. They may be drinking you know, fluids, water, whatever. Yeah. But interestingly, in Ayurveda and yoga, when we say fasting, it's not necessarily food. The moment you we use the term fasting, we say it is withdrawing your five sensory functions from the outside desires. Ah. But then, because the age that we are in, you know, we say we are in the age of darkness. It is believed that it is very difficult to control these sensory functions or desires. But what is the most easiest to control if we could? And that is what goes into the mouth, you know. It's okay. food. Okay. But then again, it's not really easy. It's quite difficult. Mm. Because in Ayurveda, again, there's a saying that, you know, just the way the earth revolves around the sun, mm -hmm. our own lives revolve around our digestive fires mm -hmm. or it is our hunger or appetite. Again, again, going into a bit of, you know, our Vedic philosophy, you must have heard these big epics like, you know, Ramayana and Mahabharata. Yes, you know, yes, like me, of yes, yeah. of course, yes. And in that it has been written that uh, there are three things in life a man or a woman will fight for or a war will begin. First of all, it's food, mm -hmm. or the second is woman, and the third is sleep. <laughs> Meaning, yes. but again in that again we put food first because yeah. without food we can't live right you will see that whenever it's interesting in today's day and age the food food is our first point of contact no matter what uh -huh. when we are happy oh yes let's celebrate let's go it's eat true. food yeah it's true oh i'm alone i'm at home i'm depressed oh let's go eat food i'm really stressed i don't know what to do at work i'm going to eat food mm -hmm. oh my child is eating food i'm going to eat food mm -hmm. you know so ultimately our point of contact which is easiest mm -hmm. is food why is that uh because again in ayurveda there is a saying that see you know we being human beings our first point of contact when we are sad depressed or happy or anything is actually another human being oh. you know that is what it is that means if i'm feeling really unhappy i want to talk to someone uh -huh. you know because that is how you get that love you know that, that concern back saying oh don't worry everything will be fine right. and everything yeah but in our today's day and age because our lives have become so solitary yes we don't really live in those big families that we used to once upon a time or you know like yes you, you had your cousins your uncles, yeah. aunts, or on the same like street so, yeah, like, exactly, so like yeah. was something that i was talking to my husband about <laughs> recently because we had come into this year and we were like but you know what now it's time to live like we've been working yeah. so hard we're just doing 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 and yes we still want to buy a new house and yes we want to move to Spain and we want to do this we want to do that but whilst we're doing that we can still live we can still enjoy our lives and we we set out both of us a goal for this year was like our relationship is cool we have a solid foundation we love each other we enjoy each other we communicate we're, we're okay let's spend more of our free time because we have very little of it obviously right but let's spend more of our free time with the people that we enjoy people our friends that we grew up with our cousins our family we we're just not doing because we all we all live so far away in so many different places and by the time it's your day off the last thing you want to do is travel for an hour and a half to go somewhere and then children and you know there's just so many things but when we grew up our friends were pretty much on the street or a couple of streets away. It's a very, very different world that we live in. You're right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, of course, you know, so going back to that point, if I don't find someone else to talk to, mm. under any such circumstances, it is believed that what is the first point of contact that will give us that love, affection and care? And that is food. 
Uh-huh. Means that when you eat food, you feel more calm, more settled. Uh-huh. No matter what food, it might be something sweet, it might be crisp, doesn't matter. It is satisfying that desire in here, and that's reason why. You know, you will see that. Of course, we're talking about food. Why food is so important? Mm. Uh, it's like if you don't get anything else or anyone else to talk to, your first point of contact for love is food. And having said that, again in Ayurveda, we too say. Two things you never do alone or by yourself is eat alone or have alcohol alone. Yeah. <laughs> Two things never by yourself because when you're with someone else, even when you're eating, you know, if you've got something going through your mind, you'll talk about it. Yes. Same thing with alcohol. Okay. You know, so in fact, that is a rule that we follow at home anyways. We don't eat alone. We don't, don't drink alcohol alone. But that is how important, again, food is for mm-hmm. us because our lives revolve around it. It's not the other way around. Sometimes that that is how it should be, mm. where we say, yes, I eat because I need that bit of food to sustain energy. Now this is the other way around. Okay. We are living to eat. So mm. I, you've sort of adapted it then, I guess, ayurvedically in your practice to to the way we consume food now is, is different to that sort of medicinal. Yeah. Uh, um, of course, even now in my practice and when I'm teaching, I still go back to the, the kind of, you know, foundation knowledge of Ayurveda, yeah. you know, food is medicine. Mm-hmm. So even when students are there and when they are sitting there alone eating, I tell them, no, you can't be sitting here. You need to go out, talk to your friends. Or, ah. you know, you can't be looking into your phone or whatever because in that way you're becoming more solitary. Okay. More, you know, within yourself. Yes. So rather than getting that stress out, mm-hmm. you are actually interna- internalizing it. So mm-hmm. it doesn't help. Okay. But yeah, food, no matter what type of food, but how you eat it and what circumstances you eat it is very important. Okay, so that affects how it goes into your body and and what it does inside you yeah. and and the I guess what if you are eating solitary, I'm going to assume that it would cause more stress within yeah, you. And... It will. Or you know, you start thinking more. Right. And right. that thinking process. Mm-hmm. Let's say I'm eating food by myself mm-hmm. and something small like oh, I didn't pay those two bills. Oh yes, yes, yes. And you know, it's gone past that you know last date of yeah. payment and I'm sitting there thinking oh my god I need to pay and because of that that heat if you want to call it rises up in the nervous system but then mm. that affects the endocrine system where it becomes overactive oh gosh so then that affects the digestive system and then more production of let's you know hydrochloric acid or enzymes where it should not be you know yes. like things need to start regulating and that is how then you will see that when people eat under stressful conditions, then they tendency is mostly towards high blood pressure or gastric ulcers, mm-hmm. duodenal ulcers, even high cholesterol because body gets confused. You know, it's time to digest, be calm, but there's so much kind of you know, pressure or stress on the liver, on the gallbladder, you know, then high cholesterol. It's like it starts affecting so many different things. It's, uh, it's fascinating. I look forward to your book, which you can plug at the end of the show, which will explain <laughs> a lot of this. So... Thank you for that explanation. I think that really makes a lot of sense with regards to food and how Ayurveda perceives food and the importance of it and how we're obviously using it today is very different to the way we, I guess, in inverted commas, should be using it. But just moving forward a little bit back to some more preconceptions. So in in Ayurvedic terms, should you be vegetarian? Should you be vegan? Should you not eat meat? Should you eat drink alcohol? I think there's there is a preconception that you should be vegan and that you shouldn't drink alcohol and like literally all fun in your life must go and I guess that almost puts people off from seeking out the practice. Yeah. First of all, both not just in Ayurveda but even in yoga, mm-hmm. we do not have the principle of veganism. Right. And maybe there are many people out there listening for what I say, but everyone knows that I'll say exactly what Ayurveda talks about. Yeah. Of course, in Ayurveda, we do talk about being vegetarian. Uh-huh. I'm not saying no to that, but vegan, definitely not. So what does being vegetarian mean? Vegetarian is literally, you know, eating vegetables or whatever, yeah. but along with that, some milk or dairy. Uh-huh. You know, meaning you're not cutting out dairy out from uh, your food. Because okay. for us in Ayurveda, ghee, clarified butter is very important in terms of cleansing, detox. But even milk is quite nourishing because ultimately it helps to nourish the bones, the nerves hair, nails, skin Mm -hmm. and you will see that I'm not saying that a person should not be vegan, mm-hmm. but never suddenly turn into it. Okay. You know, because because you're talking about, you know, what are the principles in Ayurveda? Yes. First of all, when it comes to food, even when it comes to meat. In Ayurveda, we don't look at meat as food, but we look at meat as medicine. Oh, Very important. Okay. Meat. So how does that work? 
Uh, it's from the point, let's say, meaning you don't eat meat just because you like the taste. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes, I want to have three eggs today, four eggs tomorrow. It's not out of your desire. Mm-hmm. You're eating meat because the body needs. So let's say, you know, children, they mm-hmm. will need meat because they're growing. They need that kind of, you know, protein, metabolism in the body. Or probably, you know, like uh, maybe post-operative phase, you know, where all people going through illnesses or yeah. you know, older people where the body really needs it. And that protein cannot be found in plant food? No, it's not that it can't be found. Mm-hmm. So based on that, then I was going to be talking about my next thing. See, ba- see, uh, Ayurveda looks into geography, you know, your uh-huh. local living conditions. Yeah. And you will see that now, of course, India uh, as a country predominantly is vegetarian. Mm-hmm. And it's not necessarily for religion or a customs or tradition, but it is a weather out there. Right. It is so hot and humid over there, we can't eat meat every day, you know, unlike where people can do it over here. So that means, yes, I remember when I was growing up, I come from a meat-eating background. And I used to say, yes, I'm a non-vegetarian, but all that we had was lamb once every two weeks Mm -hmm. or chicken once every two weeks. So literally, you know, like every 14 days, not every day. But even with that, we said, you know, I eat meat. So if it's a hot, so as you say, the climate in the country, like in India, you can't eat meat. What happens to inside your body if you eat meat in a hot country? Uh, Yeah. See what happens because it is so hot and humid over there, the uh, heat inside the body, like, you know, there's already excess heat in the body. Uh If I were to continue eating meat in India every day, I'll start suffering from skin conditions, boils, ulcers, high blood pressure, uh, certain types of diabetes mm-hmm. or even gastric ulcers. So that is what meat does because meat is heating. Okay. You know, but on the other hand, in colder countries, mm. first of all, you don't see a lot of sun. Sun is only three, four months a year, maybe or maybe even two yeah. or three months. Yeah. That means we can't really grow a lot of vegetables out here. Mm. You know, that's not possible. But the other uh, thing also to remember is it's so cold out here. We need that first class protein from animals to help right. sustain the body. Okay. You know, so it's that way that, and hence you will see that colder countries they eat more meat Mm -hmm. in hot and humid countries they don't so even when you look into india itself yeah all the south indian states they are vegetarian right all the north indian states be it punjab a bit of rajasthan you know kashmir all those yes they eat meat because it's cold you know they need that sustenance Mm -hmm. through meat that makes a lot of sense and i think a lot of people listening will sort of resonate with that even just in a very very basic example Mm -hmm. when you go on holiday and we tend to go to warm places don't we we don't actually eat as much as we would normally Mm -hmm. eat at home don't do we Mm -hmm. and we're quite surprised that we can sustain ourselves Mm -hmm. on maybe two light salads in the day whereas at home we'd be eating you know three meals plus three snacks and you know something just before bed it's fascinating so you know so when you uh, so going from there to understand so don't we get you know uh, vegetarian source proteins yes we do Mm -hmm. like no through lentils and dal and everything but that is more for the hot and humid countries right but then uh coming back to the thing about can a person become vegetarian or become vegan that is where i tell everyone now that depends on your ancestral dna memory in your body oh this is interesting meaning let's say i come from india mm-hmm. but i'm a meat eating person once every two weeks that means somewhere in my dna code it has been embedded oh yes you know this individual or this clan or this you know where i come from mm-hmm. there is some meat every two weeks and because the body is so used to it the memory is in there if i were to suddenly stop eating meat or even become vegan the body gets confused because it does not know. Oh, but you know, that is what the memory says in the DNA. And what does that look like? What does that confusion look like to the body? No, see, then the body starts reacting. For example, it might show up in the physical changes where, you know, the body becomes weak. There may be tremors. There may be insomnia, depending upon, you know, what you've stopped eating or sure. you haven't eaten. It's not just for what it is now. Mm-hmm. I also tell everyone, the mistake everyone is doing nowadays in turning vegan or suddenly t- turning vegan or vegetarian is, they're just thinking about themselves today. Right. So let's say I've been eating meat, let's say two, three, every two, three days, because that is what my family has done, mm-hmm. because I come from, I don't know, Finland, Sweden, like no, some very mm-hmm. cold mm-hmm. country. But then from there, if I suddenly start eating only vegetarian food every day, yes. For the first two, three years, I'm going to tell the whole world, yes, I feel great, I feel light, I feel good. But they don't understand that the effect is not just for those two, three years or today. Whatever I'm doing now mm-hmm. will actually affect me in 10 or 15 years' time. Okay. That means I might not see changes now, but in five, six years, yes, my hair will start falling because, you know, there's not enough, you know, like protein or that kind of calcium, let's say through milk, oh, or yeah. my bones will become weak. Mm. And then, then I'll start wondering, but why am I feeling so weak? I eat a healthy diet. Yes. See, healthy diet 
depends on your geographical background right. not just because they say that yes in india you can have what mangoes in march april may that means mangoes in march april may will be good here too because you know it's a different geography yes yes so same thing with the body and eating meat so that's interesting that you say that about um when you make those very drastic lifestyle food diet changes and then you could see the the, the negative effects or the harmful effects of it later down the line but the agenda here at the moment with those who are suddenly becoming vegan is that they will take the supplements instead. Mm. So they'll take, you know, they'll get their multivitamins or their specific vitamins that they need for this. And what are your views on supplements? See, uh, nothing wrong with supplements mm-hmm. if the body really needs them. But again, the moment you talk about start talking about supplements, mm-hmm. the way I put it across is that the internal system becomes lazy. For example, oh, you know, see. Okay, meaning yes, yes. when I'm eating, let's say spinach, mm-hmm. spinach has got natural iron in it. So mm-hmm. if I were to eat natural spinach or let's say even red meat, you know, it has got natural iron yes. in it. You know, so I'm giving both examples, the vegetarian and the meat related. Yeah. But the way it gets digested in the gut, the gut or the body starts working towards, you know, getting that food out. You know, mm. it's not that, oh, yes, I put taken that pure iron straight down. The body says, I don't need to do anything because that, you know, iron is there. I'm just going to absorb it. Okay. That means that internal if you want to call it tissue laziness starts right. setting in yeah so that means at times when they were to actually eat food with those supplements in it then the body might say oh but what do i do with it yeah. because it has lost the memory oh my gosh i don't know how to put see, it you know see i totally hear are, you yeah our bodies are made the way they are for a, a reason. reason yes i'm not saying no to supplements mm-hmm. But it is only when the body really, really needs it. Whereby, let's say someone is so weak yes. that the person does not have enough energy even to digest food. You know, okay, yes, where yes. there's, okay, if I know we need quick change, yeah. it is needed. But if you're healthy, if you're strong, yeah. and when I say healthy, you don't even have to be completely healthy, you know, mm. normal, average healthy. Let the body work. Yes. Because if the body becomes lazy, that means the nervous system becomes lazy. That means it is leading to that aging process. So it's 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 another moment that we're connecting on because my my son, he was born premature. He was born at 30 weeks, so sort of seven months. And when he was born, he spent his first two months of life in hospital. And, you know, that was all very stressful. And he had to be given vitamins when he left the hospital right so he had to take um oral vitamins and that was fine he was only having milk and unfortunately i wasn't producing enough milk myself so he had to have the synthetic milk product and as soon as we were able to give him animal milk i chose to give him goat's milk as opposed to cow's milk i sort of went to my roots and i don't know where it came from but as i was doing the research it was goat's milk was showing up as the closest to human milk and because i wasn't able to do it for me it was very important to give him the best possible start i could and that's what he drank and still drinks today he loves his milk he's, he's very indian in that so he's a mixed race child but he's very indian he likes it did in the morning and did in the evening but he has always had since then when he stopped taking those vitamins i pushed the agenda of food as fuel and you're going to get your nutrients from food and he has a very clean diet we don't say no to anything when he's ready to try something that's processed or whatever and he want he's curious he asks me mommy can i have a biscuit what's daddy eating can i have a biscuit then we give it to him but we don't sort of Here's a bag of sweets, Micah, eat it. You know, we've never been that those parents. And we've noticed that he will tell us what deficiency he's got in his body based on what he wants to eat. So he might come to me in the day and he'll say, Mommy, I want a snack. And I'm like, sure, what would you like? And he'll think about it and he'll say, I want grapes. Or he'll say, I want cheese. Or he's very specific or raisins or whatever. And, you know, and I look at him and I can see, okay, yes, he's, he's been at mum's. So he's eaten a lot of dal and lentils and things. So he probably wants something a little bit lighter. So it's interesting to see how, because he's a new human being, to see it actually come to life. And I see how food affects him. So Recently, the reason, the point of this story, his nails were coming off and there was sort of, it was very odd, very random. And we 
I, I sort of straight away went to holistic research. I went into the Ayurvedic side and it was saying iron was the main factor. I considered his diet and I thought, actually, yes, iron could be because the most iron he's getting is from spinach and there's not much in spinach. And I'm, you would have to give him a lot of spinach to get enough of the iron to help him with that. So then I thought, OK, what else can I give him? And I went to beef. I thought, OK, a quick shot of beef almost because it's not a regular food I give him. Um, or lamb it, it, that those aren't regular foods and so just I just added in a meal a week for the past month that was beef and or lamb and it's it's had the effect and his because his body is that's his that's like you say the DNA the the imprint his body has gone yes that's where I get my nutrients from from food so I've got it now I've got the iron that was missing I fixed your nails all is right in the world and I literally have seen this in the last four weeks happen it's it's fascinating it must be for you as well right when you see it with clients yeah like yeah that small tweak where people are expecting me to tell them no yes you have to become vegetarian or you have to do this and yeah. I tell them actually you know not just about being vegetarian even when it comes to alcohol I tell them you don't have to stop it but you know you might need to make a bit of a tweak a change yes. in terms of what type of alcohol you drink mm. and likewise you know you're still enjoying life yeah and yet you're seeing that improvement in your health so in Ayurveda we do not have a complete yes or no situation mm -hmm. no? meaning we're always doing things based on that individual's lifestyle or as I say you know their background their mm. ethnicity and accordingly we are kind of putting a plan together that's so fascinating going, going back to you know all these misconceptions if you want to call it of course you know in Ayurveda uh, for meat for us is medicine mm -hmm. yes you can be vegetarian or even vegan if they want to but it has to be a very slow process right and the way I tell people about this is Yes, you know, if you want to turn, you can't from eating meat, you suddenly turn vegan. You need to have that, you know, that general, very kind of, you know, gradual crossover to becoming first vegetarian and then vegan. Right. And even with that, I tell them, if you're eating meat every day, then make sure that once a week, one day is a no meat day. Uh -huh. You know, so let the body get used to it. Yeah. Then you change to a, to a day a week, no meat day, then three days, four days, and then slowly you're changing. Yeah, so and it's a bit from, more informed. Yeah. So, yeah. and yeah. it's gradual, the body mm. is getting used to it, but suddenly from 100 to zero, you know, body can't take it. Yeah. So in Ayurveda, everything is Ayurvedic, be it meat, be it lamb, be it alcohol, be it... Um, even being vegan, nothing wrong with it because I'm sure you must have seen that you know, so many times when we cook Indian like you know, food at home, you might cook like you no know, dal, rice, chapatis and maybe a vegetarian. You know, True. Yeah. But there is no key, there's nothing in it. Yes, yes, yes. That means in Ayurveda, yes, you can have vegan days, mm -hmm. but Ayurveda is not vegan. Science. Fabulous. <laughs> this is really good. I mean, oh my God, we could talk for so long on this. The whole topic is just so, obviously it's massive, isn't it? Um, I think just because of time, let's move on to my favorite topic in this whole genre is yoga. Mm -hmm. What is yoga? What is really yoga? See, just like Ayurveda, mm -hmm. yoga is once again a way of life. Right. The way we generally put it across, of course, you know, when people talk about yoga, they're thinking about yoga positions and breathing, you know, yes. that is yes. the thing that comes yes. to our mind. Mm -hmm. But when we talk about it, comparing it to Ayurveda, we say Ayurveda is for the body and yoga is for the mind. Mm -hmm. you know, so that is how we look into it. That means through Ayurvedic principles, you're bringing changes in the physical side. Uh -huh. Physical side can be even a, like you know, maybe vision, eyes, whatever. Yeah. But from yoga, you literally bringing change in your attitude, your mind, mm -hmm. and the, your outlook towards everything. But then again, we in Ayurveda, the way we look into, or in yoga, we say that just suddenly bringing a change in the mind is not possible. You know? Right. Let's say if I say, yes, I want to lose weight over the next 10 days, mm. the mind will say, oh, yeah, let's try and do it. But it is not always possible because you need that determination. Mm -hmm. So the, And hence what yoga has put together is so, so that you can bring changes in the mind, you need to start bringing changes in the body. Ah. And that's the reason why you will see that whenever we talk about yoga practice, mm -hmm. we always start with, you know, physical practice like positions, like sun salutations or warrior pose and everything. Because mm -hmm. yoga says that until and unless you cannot control or discipline your physical body, you cannot discipline or, you know, control your breathing. So you'll see that it is only after physical uh, practice we do breathing exercises. Oh, wow. You know, so once you've done the physical activity, then yeah. breathing, because then it becomes easy 
to control your pride. This is really interesting. I mean, oh, we, we could talk for hours on this. I I have personal bugbears, as you know, and you know I'm very vocal and opinionated about it, but it's because there's a disconnect for me when I see these practices which have all come from Ayurveda, from yoga. For me, when I see it, I'm like, you can't use it in a silo. So those who, so I'm not against you taking up any of these practices that come from the philosophies, so like breath work, meditation, yoga, etc. I'm not against that. But if you can't connect the dots as to why breath work helps and how how it helps and at what point in your self-development journey breath work is going to help then you're never really going to see the effects of it you'll see it for that hour that you're there doing class but that's it because you don't know how to apply it to your personal life which is obviously going to be different to the other six people in the class with you same with yoga like when people go to this one hour class 90 minute class and they feel really satisfied oh I did a headstand and things like that that very surface level stuff it's like but then how are you now taking that into your every day because that is what you're supposed to be gaining from that class it doesn't mean i go to yoga therefore i am there is obviously yeah absolutely you know that's correct you know so it's and hence you know it's not not as you said not just doing that one hour of practice mm-hmm. but how have you taken anything that you've learned from that one hour mm-hmm. and you've applied it into your next six days until mm-hmm. you come back for the next class mm-hmm. you know? so that is also one thing and that is where we say until unless you can't control your body you can't control your breath and just believe that if you can't control discipline your breath mm-hmm. you cannot control your thoughts oh wow. you know, so you're taking it one level further and that is where meditation comes okay. you know so first body controlling the body disciplining the body then disciplining the breath and then disciplining the mind because it is believed that our expressions through the five sensory functions mm-hmm. but where do those expressions come from comes from the mind which is in there and it's thinking Mm -hmm. so when i'm happy i'm smiling Mm -hmm. when i'm really sad i'm crying you know when i'm really irritated i'm yelling that means there's a mind that is controlling those thoughts then ultimately is controlling your outlook Mm -hmm. towards what is happening around you this is again super interesting talking about mental health so i had depression a few years uh not a few years ago now but a, a, a while ago now and it was something that was said to me a lot about getting outside, getting outside, getting outside, physically, being physically in a sep- in a different place and things like that. And as, as you're speaking, I was just hearing because there's a lot of memes and things on social media. I saw a recent one saying is about mental health, saying that, you know, you say to, to me that I should go outside when I'm not feeling good, but it's not as simple as that. And it's like, well, it's no, no, it's not as simple as that. But you can see where now, where the link is, because I think a lot of information we consume in the West is very in a silo. There's no link to it. There's no... You you know, to find the scientific backup as to why that is the case is is very lacking. And therefore, people don't do things informed and then they can't sustain it. And then, yes, it doesn't work. But like you're saying there, if 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 it's body first, then breath, then mind, somebody is depressed. You have to physically control your physical body first before you can get to the mind. So the mind is almost the last, as you're saying, is the last place to actually get the therapy that it needs because yeah. you can't control. Yeah. See, of course, you know, on one hand, it is because you're trying to control the mind, but we can't easily do the mind. So what is the best, easiest approach mm-hmm. through the body? Because mm-hmm. you'll see that. I might still be depressed or unhappier, but if someone says, no, just walk up and down the stairs 20 times, I can easily do it. But if someone says, no, just smile 20 times, I can't. You right. Know? I mean, you know, physically, yeah. we are able to start, able to bring those changes, mm-hmm. then which will ultimately affect the mind. And does that have something to do with hormones as well? Yeah, you know, everything. Okay. See, when we say, literally, when we say physical activity. Yes. I know, it's literally going back whole circle. Yes. So even when I have to sit here saying, okay, fine, I need to move. But mm. where is that thought coming from? It's still coming from the mind. Right. You know, it's like you're going that full circle. Yes. Even though you don't realize, you're still starting that first trigger point in the mind saying, I need to move. So this is interesting as somebody who has fluctuated with weight a lot. So this is where you have to lead from your, I guess your heart almost, Mm. to want to physically move so that you can lose weight. This is a very simplistic Mm. example I'm giving, but is that sort of, does that sound like how it would sort of work? Because I know that as when you're overweight, you do struggle with a lot of this. Mm. Oh, I can do this. Yes, I can plan my meals and I can do that. And then I'll exercise on this day at this time. And I'll do that. Oh, I do like swimming as well. So I might just add swimming. And we do all this. And like you say, it's all in the mind. But come the day to do it, 
or the motivation, the physical. And it's funny because in my practice, and this is something that I do a lot for myself, is every movement counts. And by just that little phrase, I'll do the extra walk. Mm. I'll walk that little bit extra. And I'm literally like, it's extra steps, you know, like counting on my Fitbit. And just that little bit gets me to my 10,000 steps a day, which is meaning that I'm not gaining any weight. And that was important for me this year, not to gain weight. I want to lose it, but I know that there's a lot more. I have to get out of my head at the moment for that. But by doing that very simple thing, like you say, just do, physically doing it, it's starting the process. So I make conscious, more conscious decisions when it comes to let's go out for dinner. And then it's like, mm, OK, well, we could do afternoon tea. But then I think, no, afternoon tea is too much food, actually. So let's go for dinner and I can have more control then of what I'm consuming. So fascinating. So coming back to it in Ayurveda and, of course, in yoga, for us, movement is very important, mm-hmm. you know, air movement, literally. Okay. So even in yoga, now when we say air movement, it's just not physical movement or breath movement, mm-hmm. but how you control your thought movement process. Oh. You know, because when you're thinking, there's movement in the mind. I so know. ultimately, be it Ayurveda yoga, it is healthy, physical, mental, emotional movement or mm-hmm. activity. Mm-hmm. Now, one thing, of course, you did ask, so what is yoga? You know, of course, yoga is all about controlling the mind. But as I also said, yoga is also your attitude. Mm. So more than anything else, mm-hmm. it is your outlook, your attitude towards things. Mm-hmm. For example, yes, you know, people say, yes, I'm a yoga teacher. I practice yoga. I wake up 5.30 in the morning. I do my physical practice. Yes, I'm vegan. I'm vegetarian. I might do this. I might do that and all of that. But then I remember my professor, my teacher in India, he said, a person may wake up at 5.30 in the morning, do their physical practice. They might not eat onions or garlic, or they may be in headstand for 30 minutes and everything. But ultimately, when that person goes to the office and because something is going wrong, if they start yelling and shouting at someone else, everything else is not yoga. Wow. Meaning, you know, it's not for what you do, saying I'm in that meditation pose or sun salutation. All of that is no, it does not matter at all if when it is really needed, how did you react in that situation? Wow. I'm so that glad is you yoga. <laughs> I'm so glad you've just backed up because obviously when I'm when I'm talking, I sound very opinionated and I don't mean to be, but I'm very much, you know, just 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 be informed about the things that you do. You know, this is it's it's a form of respect to an ancient practice that isn't from your heritage and things like that. That's I think that's where I get my bit of my bugbear. I don't like I say, I don't have a problem with anybody embracing these uh, therapies, but do them with some information, understand what they understand, what it means to be yogic, really. You know, when you see people calling themselves yogis and stuff, it's like, well, darling, you know, you don't live the yogic philosophy. <laughs> you can't call yourself a yogi, you know, just like yourself. Even I'm very opinionated yeah. <laughs> and all my students know it. And I, in fact, the other day I was like, you know, reading something and from a few weeks ago, several months ago, you know, a few Mm. kind of information put together. I read online where people say they are Ayurveda experts, yogi experts or whatever. Uh Then when they, when you read their articles, I'm sorry, this is my opinion. Now (laughs) you can see it. (laughs) They, but they have no idea of what a faulty food combination is Ah, in Ayurveda. Right. Or be it in yoga when you're saying, you know, do nasal wash, what it really is. Yes. So, again, you know, going back to your point, you know, yeah. like if you are looking to follow, mm. then yes, follow it as, and hence I call myself an Ayurveda or yoga enthusiast. Mm-hmm. I know, you know, I teach, I talk, I do consultations, but I can't call myself as an expert, you know, myself. Mm-hmm. I know many people say, no, Dr. Deepa, yes, you're the expert. And I say, no, I'm still learning mm-hmm. because every day I'm learning something new. Yes. But on the contrary, I see all of these people out there putting themselves as experts. And that in itself falls into yogic philosophy, doesn't it? That you are always learning, yeah. that you are never complete. So I, I was having a little chat with somebody yesterday, a very young person, and she was like, I, I don't know my identity. I need my identity. And I said, but you are you. And yeah. she's like, yes, but I need I need to put myself in a box. And it's like, no, you're, you're 23. You need to live. You don't know who you are. You're never really going to know who you are, and you know, but, and, until the end of time, because that's not what life is about. And you're always going to change. Life is dynamic as things happen to you, as you live through experiences. Your, your person is going to change. And it's up to you how you want to change, of course. But 
it's it's d- trying to desperately define who she is and my heart was breaking for her because I was like oh darling don't spend time on this like you're never going to get that answer none of us are going to get that answer mm-hmm. just embrace life as a continuous learning process everything that happens to you everything you experience everything you do win fail whatever grief is all an a learning opportunity and that is what that's who you are you are somebody who is always learning and it does it does it absolutely I mean, no, that is correct wrong. yeah you know so as you said either putting themselves in boxes or calling themselves certain names mm. or even going back to the whole thing about you know yoga experts yes the moment even they use that term there is ego and it is the ah, exact opposite ego. Very of what yoga is mm. in yoga we say when you start practicing yoga you have to let go of your ego no attachment you're detaching yourself to everything mm-hmm. but on the contrary if you if you start putting such terms mm. then as you say you know your whole journey of learning mm-hmm. you're not there yet you yeah. know meaning the moment you start putting yourself up there you're not really following yoga because you're saying yes you know i studied yes i've gone to that point but mm. still i'm done here because i still need to achieve more and same thing about when people say they they have this need to put them into a box is that yeah. an ego you know it's that ego related mm. thing because they the moment we say identity mm. in yoga we use this one term called ahankar you know ahankar ahankar of oh, that aham meaning i and kara meaning i am so is that i am feeling mm-hmm. that natural i am feeling is very essential for our survival right but then beyond that it turns into that you know a uh, cultivated ego which is arrogance mm. and that is where sometimes it happens where people say they want to be put it into ser- put themselves into certain boxes or that quality of identity that why the identity because they need their ego to be up there right. you know to have that thing so fascinating again <laughs> another topic we could talk about forever the the last thing i wanted to ask you turmeric lattes <laughs> tell me about them because this is how we actually connected yeah. wasn't it there was a post on social media that you put and i have been god waxing lyrical about turmeric lattes like to anyone and everyone who will listen to me because i'm like this is a uh, no no this is like benelin it's like literally drinking a, a bottle of benelin and you if you drink it every day it's not actually going to have the effect and and you know like a lot of things i'll say something and i like to back it up so now this time you are my backup for this <laughs> explain the whole obviously you know whenever there's a capitalist opportunity for a trend and a fad it's going to happen we know that so you know whenever there's a trend or fad when it happens and those other people out there they talk about let's say not term reclutics mm. I understand. You know, they're doing it because they want to be on the strength saying, oh, yes, I'm, I'm having this term reflected. Yes. It's okay. But when I see all these, now I'm going to laugh about it. Are you really experts? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Putting it up there and right. then term reflected. And I think, no, but have you really studied? Do you really know what Ayurveda is when it comes to such things? Mm. Of course, we, didn't, we actually don't have any latte like no system or science in Ayurveda. Yes, we have. turmeric milk mm-hmm. where you just literally heat up uh, you know maybe boil of course you know some yes. turmeric milk then put a bit of turmeric maybe a bit of ghee or you know other things in it but then maybe have it maybe in the evening or in the morning first of all only if you think you're going to be coming down with a flu or fever or you know you're going to be falling ill probably mm-hmm. for that or then on the other hand is like you know with milk turmeric and ghee is for children or pregnant women if they think they are going to be a bit constipated you know so that is as you say it's a medicine no it's yes. literally a therapy something similar to khichdi you know as you said mm-hmm. we eat khichdi only when that one day of fasting or when you're not well because mm. these are the things that are then giving that energy to the body saying you know i know you need to rest so i'm just going to give you a bit of this extra nourishment so that when you get better mm-hmm. you don't need to have it anymore And coming back to lattes, what is a latte? It is frothed milk. Ah, okay. Meaning that is what they're doing, isn't it? <clears throat> and then like frothy milk. When this frothy milk, it changes the constitution as it goes into your yeah, body. Yeah. See, for us, milk is bata dryness reducing, so it's it is warming, it ah. is nourishing, it's lubricating. Mm-hmm. But along with that, when you're drink, taking in that froth, which is air, mm-hmm. that means you are actually bringing bata or air out of balance. Ah. You know, it's like when you're looking both yeah, ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you just have hot milk Brilliant. with turmeric. Um, I will be yes, that is Ayurveda. But <laughs> as you say, you know, you don't try to modernize Ayurveda by using Ayurveda these terms. You right. know the way they're trying to do. Not that Ayurveda cannot be modern. Yes. 
but certain things have to be you know respected and put where they are yeah otherwise they're not going to work if they don't follow the the teachings they're not actually going to work Mm -hmm. like we say it's you can you can go to yoga class but if you don't follow the principles of yoga philosophy then Mm -hmm. the class is only going to do what it does for 60 minutes it's not going to do anything more to Mm -hmm. your life you're you're training your brain to think it is but really it's it's not actually having the effect it would have Mm -hmm. or what you're what you're hoping for it to have Okay, I think we'll leave it there because there's a, there's a whole other show, and if you want if you want more, you can join our workshop on the 18th of April. And what I'd like you to perhaps share with the listeners, I think, because you know none of us are perfect. I think that's fair to say that none of us are perfect. Like you say, you 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 don't feel comfortable to call yourself an expert yet, whereas I'm very comfortable to call you an expert. But you're an expert compared to me, for instance, in that, and I understand you're humbling there. So, what what do you do in your life? Maybe t- three top three things that you do every single day that keeps you balanced, happy whatever it is to you that you need in your day to keep you going? Uh, first of all, food. You know, food, food okay. <laughs> yeah. um, you see, based on my constitution and the way I am, I eat only once a day. Okay. Around five or six in the evening because mm-hmm. I know that is the time that suits me best mm-hmm. and even for my constitution. If I were to have breakfast and then lunch and then dinner, mm-hmm. I know that would bring me completely out of balance. Mm-hmm. So even when I say I eat once a day, not because I, I don't starve for the rest of the day. I genuinely am not hungry. Mm-hmm. So what Ayurveda says is eat only when you really feel hungry. And that hunger, you need to feel in the stomach, mm-hmm. not in your mouth or on your tongue, where when someone starts talking about food, you know, you feel, oh, I'm oh hungry. Yes. That is false hunger. Oh. True hunger comes from the stomach. Literally, you, know, you, you feel actually feel it. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. So that is one thing that I do. I eat once a day because mm-hmm. I know that is more than enough for me. Mm-hmm. And then that also helps me with my metabolic processes, my sleep, you know, everything. So mm-hmm. that is one thing. The other thing that I will definitely do every day is take some Ayurvedic herbs, like, you know, some herbs that help me, like, Trifla or turmeric, pram, you know, there's like two, three herbs that mm-hmm. I take every day. Mm-hmm. That is a second important thing. I do a lot of other things, but I'm trying to see, you know, things from a more everyday basis, just not the physical side, but the mind side is also mm-hmm. important. And hence, from that point of view, I make sure that I spend some time with my son. Because he's 14 years old now. Yeah. But as and when I can, ever since he was a child, every day, one or two hours. Mm-hmm. Now we've come to that point where he's 14 years old. Mm. He's a teenager. But we are still in the living room. And, you know, uh, he might be on his laptop doing his work, but I'm on my laptop on my side. But there's some television going on. Mm-hmm. And I remember my son Rohan saying the other day that I know we really don't talk for that hour. But for me, this is like a bonding time. You know, that feeling of having someone around. It's the having someone around. And it's that yeah. happiness that you get out of mm-hmm. it. Of course, that is what I do nowadays with him. Yes. But I know things keep changing. Sometimes we might spend an hour, two hours just talking about something. Or he might want to come and help me in cooking. So it's that spending time with someone oh yeah it's my son because you know, I, when i go back home yes. that's the kind of time i get with him so that those are the three main things that i would say that really you know it's like bringing back that balance be it physically emotionally mentally mm-hmm. these are the three things i think that's that's a beautiful way to end the show because we started with the connection and relationships from the start and obviously we've ended with your son i think that's beautiful dr deepa thank you so much for being on the show and really thank you for having it. me here on the show too and yeah thanks a lot thank you <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Self Care 101 podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, I would love it if you would subscribe and review so that other people like you can find the show. For more tips and tricks, you can follow me on the socials at Frankly Coaching or visit my website to find out more about my coaching programs and how to work with me at franklycoaching.com.